Hello everyone, this is Kuwagatamushi, and today we're going to take a look at Owlboy by D-Pad Studio. It's a game that's been in development for nine years, and I only heard about it within the last couple of years, and I was really amazed by the pixel art style. You see a lot of indie games coming out nowadays, and they try to use an 8-bit art style, but this game goes for a more high-bit approach, like 16 or 32 bits, and it really works in the game's favor. The game is beautiful. So I'm going to showcase a bit of the story, a bit of the gameplay, not a whole lot, probably about 15 minutes. And I think that really should be enough to convince you to get this game. I don't really have time to review this game because I'm working on the review for another game whose review should be up in the next couple of days. But I still wanted to make a video on this game and give some thoughts on it. So I'm going to skip the first cutscene and just get right into the gameplay. So the first thing you'll notice from this shot is the amazing sprite work at play. Look at the grass, look at the detail of the grass and the foliage in this game. How natural the clouds look, the cragginess of the mountains. All of this was done by one guy, Simon Anderson. The dev team for this game was pretty darn small, I think like five or six people, but Simon was the sole artist, so this is an amazing feat. And I say that knowing full well that dev teams for 16-bit games were pretty small too, but you don't see this level of quality coming from indie dev teams nowadays. I think a lot of that has to do with nostalgia and people thinking more fondly of the 8-bit days compared to the 16-bit ones, but SNES and Genesis graphics were good too, guys. And I don't think there was any art-based agenda for making this game other than let's make a game with some good sprite-based artwork. I'm just saying that not every game has to look like an NES game. Anyway, you probably already noticed that I'm flying like a natural, and that's because the controls are really, really intuitive. Also because I've played about halfway through the game already. It's really addictive. I spent all night playing this game last night, so I'm pretty used to the game's mechanics already. As you can see, flying is infinite, there's no bar or anything, and you can fly anywhere as long as there's no boundary. You can get a short boost by pressing the roll button, which is B or circle if you're using DualShock 4. I know some of us still like to use those. In fact, I personally bought one of those USB receiver devices recently, and I'm going to try that out soon. Another thing that makes you faster is eating fruit, and you can see that it also extends your life bar by a little bit, so eat that fruit, guys. Some other stuff that you see me doing is pulling treasure chests or rocks out of the ground, and those yield what's called buccaneer coins, which can be used at a shop uh, that I'll show you later on. Flying through the rings also gives you- Whoa. You just saw that shadow jumping up, right? I swear, that's the first time I saw this. Naturally, there's secrets lying around in the nooks and crannies of the areas, so flying around and checking everything is a good idea. So this guy right here is Getty. He's your best and probably only friend in the village. He's a human soldier and really talkative, and oftentimes that gets the party into trouble. He also tends to speak for Otis, considering Otis is mute. Like, for real, as a part of the story. And that's actually a good explanation for why Otis is a silent protagonist. I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead and showcase this. You can see in a story like this, there's always gonna be those two guys that always talk trash about the main character. But unlike some of the more recent Zelda games, this extends to a lot of the village too. Some incidental conversation with villagers, like Mandolin and the guards who guard the gate, show that they think Getty and Otis are just playing around, slacking off. Though some of the villagers genuinely like Otis, and this part's particularly funny. Still, Otis's mentor Asio and the professor, who is apparently Getty's mentor, are really arrogant, to the point where they don't even like each other. In any case, here's another put-upon guy named Solus, and you don't get to see him a whole lot, honestly. But hey, here's that shadow again, and let's go ahead and chase him. Picking Getty up gives you access to his pistol, and you can aim his shots with the right stick. We see here that the so-called Troublemaker is basically some sort of Spider-Man, and he gets away. And here we are basically starting the first dungeon. 
The first few dungeons are easy, but that changes after a narrative turning point. These bat things are pretty easy to kill, and they go down in two or three shots. You can either drop Getty on the switches, or step on them yourself. Let's go ahead and talk about the design of the gameplay. I really like how D-Pad paces the introduction of gameplay elements in this game, taking time to point out the introduction of a bat enemy or a wall pooping out a rock or something. That kind of pacing gets you used to the tools that you have, and the enemies and their mechanics, so you're not blindsided when a mixture of enemies and puzzles turns up. I usually try not to do that, but I think it's really funny that you have the ability to knock your partners down. Spider-Man gets away again. <laughs> I know I mentioned this already, but I really like how this wall is basically just pooping out a rock. I'm guessing that's the only way the devs thought they could replenish your supply of rocks, but I really think a stack of rocks would have been just as fine. He's okay. Okay, so Otis and Getty are now separated, meaning you don't have access to Getty's abilities. I had Otis on his own before, but this is the first introduction to combat without your gunner, and it lets you get used to getting by on your own without one. Like, now I know I can use a spin attack to turn or destroy things. Of course, at the same time, this really only applies to the environment. For example, I can't spin attack an enemy and kill them like I could if I had Getty as a gunner. But, as you see here, you can use your spin attack to knock projectiles back and you can kill enemies that way. You can also pick up environmental objects and throw them at enemies and achieve the same effect. Another thing to note is that, sometimes when you defeat all enemies in an area, a treasure chest will show up, dispensing buccaneer coins. The game actually tells you the maximum number of buccaneer coins in an area, so it's usually best to kill all the enemies. So, this bat right here is wearing a mask. And, at least in this area, these protect enemies from Getty's pistol shots. All you have to do is use a spin attack and then use Getty's pistol to finish the enemy off. And we found Getty. Or Getty's found us. Like I said, Getty's really talkative. Oh, a bat and baby bats. I just killed your babies. Good time to pick up some fruit now. The game doesn't really tell you this very well, but each colored fruit gives you a different status effect. Like, green will primarily recover health, orange will up your gunner's rate of fire, blue raises your defense, I think, red raises your attack, and I think yellow raises your speed. These status effects aren't really necessary in the beginning because the dungeons are so easy, but once you get to the Forbidden Temple, Eating fruit and maintaining some sort of status buff is always a good idea. 
here's the first time when you actually have to leave your gunner character on a switch. And after this instance, I just started dropping characters on the switches all the time. There are also character specific switches, so you can't just drop the same guy onto every switch. Shoot, can't go this way. This is probably the only time that this is going to be necessary, but here's an anvil that we can pick up. Carry it over here to the switch, drop the anvil, pick up Getty, and we'll be on our way. As I said earlier, there's a maximum number of buccaneer coins for every dungeon and area, so you should always destroy every rock to collect every coin. I'm saying this because the only way to get the best item in the game is to collect every coin. Oh shit, I just dropped them. See what I mean? I get this picture of Otis just throwing Getty around, smacking him all over the place, dropping him. I don't even understand why they're friends at this point. Are we stuck? Of course we're stuck. Of course we're stuck. Oh no, this can't be good. Could it be a boss fight? This is a really good example of what I was stating earlier about pacing. This boss fight right here showcases the interplay between the spinning and shooting mechanics, since the mask is so hard that Getty's shots won't even get through. Yeah, I know, I'm sucking hard right now, but I'm really trying to get through this as fast as possible. I mean, you see me trying to throw the mask away so that the boss doesn't pick it up again, but it's not really working out. And the boss is defeated! Just take this mask and toss it at this rock and go back and get Getty. Although I'm not really sure if I even need to get him. It's an ancient owl relic. That is a good question. Why is it here? Well, look who it is, right on time, Spider-Man. You know, I know this guy has a name, I just don't know it yet. Welcome to my parlor, said the spider to the- <laughs> That's freaking corny. Amazing! Let's talk some more. Just talk. Oh, you know this isn't gonna end well. Let's take a tiny chip. What harm could it do? This seems like a bad idea, so he keeps doing it. Yeah, what might happen? It's 
skip. So now we have a teleportation device, meaning I don't have to carry my gunner around everywhere. I can fly free as a owl and only teleport him in when I need him. And technically, I don't have to teleport him in first. I can just press the fire button and he'll appear. This also applies to the two other gunners you get later. So we are now back at the beginning of the cave. It sounds like it came from the outside. That can't be good. Right. Now we can see the primary antagonists of this game. I mean, you can't have a story without a primary antagonist. And of course it had to be Sky Pirates, right? Oh no, the cannon isn't fixed. That one cannon was totally going to stop all of those Sky Pirate ships. Eat. Honestly, I don't really need to eat anything considering I'm not going to get harmed at all for like the rest of this video. But, like I said earlier, it's still good to be full so you can fly faster. Getting spotted by these searchlights means absolutely nothing. Of course Asio's bad, right? Oh shut up! Good old mechanical agitation. Of course the map works now, right?
They're going to call a town meeting to discuss the really important thing that I'm going to skip over now. Moving ahead, I'll show the last bit that I'm going to show for this video. This area right here is kind of like a hub. A lot of the areas that you access are accessed from here. Here is Buccaneer's shop. I'm really trying to think of a character that Buccaneer reminds me of, but I really can't at the moment. Though her helpers look really familiar, and given when development of this game started, I'm not even surprised. Doesn't this look like a prinny? I mean, it looks like a penguin. It's kind of stupid and takes punishment from its owner. The only thing that it doesn't do is say dude a lot. So yeah, collecting those Buccaneer coins nets you some really good prizes. The first one being a canteen that extends your health bar by a little bit. You can refill it too, though I've never done that. The next relic that you get at 500 coins gets you a really, uh, wonderful hat. <laughs> that shit is savage. <laughs> anyway, the game doesn't tell you this, but wearing a particular character's hat changes the properties of the gunner's shot. Alright, I think that's as far as I'm gonna go. But yeah, this is Owlboy by D-Pad Studio, a development team of five or six people who made this game over a period of nine years. It's getting rave reviews and for a good reason. It's sitting at a 91 a Metacritic right now, and let's be real, I don't use that as a metric for how good a game is because there are a lot of garbage games on Metacritic. But this game is, right now, the fourth highest rated game of 2016. So that's saying a lot about the critical consensus. It's on PC, it's $25, and it's a must-buy game.
Be sure to tell me what you think about this game or any other indie game in the comments below. Give this video a like or dislike, and by all means, feel free to subscribe to my channel if you want to see game reviews without fluff or BS, and who knows, maybe I'll show more small bits of gameplay for games that I want to talk about but can't review down the road. There are so many.